Hi guys, welcome back to Room Org TV. I am executive editor Andrea Subasati, and I'd like to invite you to Frightmare in the Falls, happening October 26th and 27th, presented by Room Org. We've got a whole bunch of great guests coming. We've got Kane Hodder, Bill Mosley, Barbara Crampton, and much more. I'll be there. I hope to see you. Enjoy this episode, and we'll see you next time. Hi, I'm Paul Korup, and welcome back to Connexploitation on Room Org TV. Today on Connexploitation, I'm going to be doing a profile of uh, one of Canada's more interesting horror films. Um, the film I've chosen to talk about today is uh, The Playgirl Killer. Um, now, this movie was actually uh, shot in 1965 in Montreal. It's actually Canada's second horror movie after The Mask. A lot of people know a lot about The Mask, but uh, this film has tended to fall into obscurity. Playgirl Killer was Canada's first color horror film. It was actually shot in 1965, but it didn't actually play theatrically until 1968, which wasn't really that uncommon for Canadian films, as they often struggled to find distribution in those early days. Um, what's interesting about the movie is that it was actually stars William Kerwin, who exploitation film fans should know because he was uh, starred in many Bruce Gordon Lewis films of the 1960s. Uh, he appeared in uh, two of the three Blood Trilogy films, of course, Blood Feast from 1963 and 2000 Maniacs in 1964. When Percy Gordon Lewis wanted to make a follow-up, the third Blood film, he wanted to make a movie called Color Me Blood Red. Now, William Kerwin and his brother Harry, uh, just about the same time, came up with a script about an artist who murders young uh, models because they won't stay still when he's trying to paint them. Now, I, I, this is purely speculation on my part, but it seems to me that they had actually hoped to get this script made, um, to have H.G. Lewis direct this as the third film, since he was thinking of doing a, a, a film about a killer artist. Um, but in the end, that didn't happen. So in 1965, H.G. Lewis went off to make his killer artist movie called Color Me Blood Red, which is about an artist who uh, murders women and starts using their, the actual blood as, as paint in his paintings. Whether he even saw William Kerwin's script, I'm not sure, but it seems very coincidental that Kerwin did not star in that third of the Blood, uh, blood Trilogy and instead came up to Montreal where he worked with a Canadian cast and crew creating kind of a rival killer artist movie at almost exactly the same time for the uh, summer of 1965. And even though Playgirl Kill isn't a, a H.G. Lewis film, it does share a lot of similarities with his other movies. It may not be quite as gory, but it has that same kind of oversaturated color, nudity, or at least the, the hint of nudity, and kind of the uh, um, regional film, low budget, threadbare quality that makes H.G. Uh, Lewis's film so charming. Kerwin plays Bill, kind of an artist and drifter who's walking around Montreal and ends up taking a job as a handyman uh, for a young woman, Arlene, who, uh, who is taking care of her family's big estate house. He tries to get her to pose for some pictures, but she won't hold still. And every time she, she does, he starts to lose his temper. And uh, eventually uh, he reveals to her that he experiences this recurring nightmare based on an event that happened when he was younger. Um, when he was worked as a sailor, three women were drowning and he was uh, stuck on a ship unable to help them. And this uh, recurring dream that he keeps having of, of uh, uh, three women drowning and a woman on the, on the shore holding a bow and arrow and a shadowy figure in, in the corner um, has haunted him for ever since. And he's hoping that by painting this exact scene that he can kind of figure out who this shadowy figure is and stop the anxiety that he feels every time he has this uh, uh, nightmare. In order to finish the picture, what he decides to do is actually murder women, stick them in a meat freezer to freeze them into certain shapes, and then he can they'll hold still while he paints this picture and kind of absolves himself of the guilt that he feels over this uh, past traumatic event. Aside from, uh, from Bill Kerwin, uh, most of the other cast and crew is actually uh, Canadian, including kind of the lead actress who plays across from him, playing Arlene, it's, it was an actress named uh, Jean Christopher, who was kind of had a reputation at the time for being a bit of a bombshell. 
Um, she had been on a show, a CBC show called Nightcap, which was kind of a sketch satire show in the 60s. She ended up leaving that show uh, and was in a movie called The Love Blackmailer, which uh, was shot in Toronto in the 1960s and created a big stir as uh, a politician ended up seeing photos of her in a magazine in which she was wearing only her underwear and proclaimed that the movie was a sex orgy movie. Of course, the film itself uh, was nothing of the kind and wasn't didn't even get released until the 1970s. But she had quite a name for herself when she appeared uh, in this film. And interestingly enough, she also brought along her sister, who plays her sister in the movie. There is some confusion over who actually directed this movie. Originally, it was supposed to be a guy named Martin Green, who later on in the 1980s directed a horror film called Dark Sanity. Uh, he was a local Montreal filmmaker, but it seems he was fired pretty quickly from the job. Um, they ended up bringing in this other director named Eric Santamarina. Not much is really known about him, but it appears that he was some kind of New York City stage director that they kind of brought up for a couple weekends to finish off the film. Um, even the film's producer, Max Sendall, on his website, he claims he directed part of the film too. But it's not really clear on who directed what or who was fired when. But even still, the film does kind of have a continuity to it. It doesn't necessarily feel like there was too much behind the scene chaos. This film also has a couple musical numbers. They actually brought Neil Sedaka to come up to Canada to shoot a, uh, a, a kind of a concert scene at the pool uh, where he does a song called The Water Bug, which he told the press at the time was going to be a big hit. And everyone have fun and what a bug. Of course it wasn't. Maybe a little more interesting for Canadians, there's a, a performance by a band called JB and the Playboys. Now these guys were uh, dubbed by the press Montreal's Beatles. And they'd actually open for the Beach Boys, they'd open for Rolling Stones. They were a, a, a popular local band and they appear in the film, not only backing up Neil Sedaka's The Water Bug, but they also do a cover of uh, Ray Charles' Leave My Baby Alone. And they're pretty good. Unfortunately, they, uh, they pretty much broke up by the time this film came out. The other uh, musical performance happens a little later in the film when Bill's character is driving through the streets of, uh, of Montreal uh, and seeing the nightlife and ends up in a hotel lobby or in a hotel uh, bar where he uh, sees a woman named Andre Champagne, who is a local Quebec crooner who sings a song called Montage. The other thing that's kind of interesting about that when he's driving down the street is that he drives past a Montreal theater called The Strand, which is actually where the Playgirl Killer debuted. And I always thought it would be fun to watch a movie in a theater where you are watching it and the, the killer is outside, the, you see him actually outside the theater. Now the film's trailer promises an unforgettable psychedelic experience, but the film itself is pretty tame. There's not very much uh, blood going on for a film that probably, that may have been directed by H.G. Lewis at one time. Uh, early on in the film, Bill shoots at one of the uh, one of his models that won't hold hold still with a spear gun, and she kind of topples over, and there's a bit of blood in the water. But a lot of the other kills are kind of off screen, or you see Bill kind of going after the women, and as though he's going to strangle them, kind of in a POV shot. Um, instead, there's a little bit more kind of uh, sex and skin illusions happening in the film. Um, at one point, uh, um, Arlene goes skinny dipping and all the characters are always trying to seduce Bill, of course. For most intents and purposes, it's, it's kind of a, the Playgirl Killer is very similar to kind of other killer artist movies that were happening at the time. I'm thinking of films like Bucket of Blood or The Headless Eyes and of course Color Me Blood Red. And while it's tempting to call this kind of a proto slasher for the way Bill kind of, uh, the film focuses on Bill and the way he kills the women, um, it's more of a psychological horror because there's no, uh, unlike a lot of those other films, there's no kind of authority figure or police detective who is chasing Bill or trying to solve these crimes. In fact, the crimes don't seem to be noticed by anybody uh, around. Um, instead, it's the kind of the picture, the, the painting that Bill is making that ends up uh, dominating the film and ends up being kind of the source of his downfall um, as he's trying to complete this picture and, and, and solve his psychological dilemma, um, it really becomes a, a question of whether he's going to be able to do it. Now the Playgirl Killer was originally released in Canada in 1968. Uh, a little later it was picked up by a small US distributor called Hemisphere Pictures and toured down the south, usually kind of at the bottom of double bills. Um, where the film kind of started to pick up a bit of a cult following was by playing on TV. The film was renamed a Decoy for, a decoy for Terror 
and it often played kind of throughout the 1970s as a Saturday afternoon movie. Um, and the fact that it didn't have a lot of blood probably made it uh, good, uh, a good choice for television broadcast. Um, it was released on, uh, DV, on, uh, on VHS in the 1980s by New World, uh, but the film's only received one actual DVD release. And I, I don't know if you told you are, but I certainly remember these uh, old jewel case style DVD cases. Um, this came out in 2001, almost 20 years old now, and it's been the only release of Playgirl Killer. So it seems that uh, um, it's the kind of film that really should be uh, uh, put on Blu-ray and uh, um, uh, to be discovered by a whole new generation. So if you're a fan of H.G. Uh, Lewis movies or other kind of sick 1960s shockers, the kind of thing that something weird video might put out, you probably enjoy this very early slice of Canadian horse sleeves. You must see Playgirl Killer in shivering color. This is Paul Corp, and thanks for watching Exploitation on Rumor TV. I'll see you next time. second part.